For so sworn, good or evil, an oath may not be broken, and it shall pursue oath-keeper and oath-breaker to the world's end. Greetings and well met, my friends. Joyston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today, I wanted to take a look at oaths, dooms, and curses in Tolkien's works, to learn a bit more about what they are and why they are so powerful. With my Building a World videos, I look at different thematic and overarching aspects of Tolkien's works to see how he created them and the Legendarium that we know today. Please check out the articles and videos that are linked in the description below and cards above for the sources that relate to and aided in the creation of today's video. Now, thank you all for joining me today, let us begin our tale. Before we look at the possible reasons and theories as to why oaths, dooms, and curses are so powerful in Tolkien's works, let us first look a bit at the major oaths, dooms, and curses themselves. Concerning oaths, we have quite a few to work with, and it's possible I may not mention them all. Just as the quote at the beginning of this tale states, oaths, or sworn promises to do or uphold a vow, pursue their takers, whether they are keepers or breakers of that oath, unto the oaths end or the world's end. One of our first and most well-known and deadly oaths taken in the history of Middle-earth is the infamous Oath of Feanor and his seven sons. This oath, taken during the Years of the Trees in the city of Tyrion in Eldamar in the west, was a promise that Feanor and his sons made to pursue the Silmarils, making war with any who withheld them, and this they swore by evoking the name Eru the Allfather. This oath would dominate the events of the Silmarillion, causing kinslayings and great strife between elves of different factions. Of this oath, Mithros and Maglor, the two eldest sons of Feanor, who yet were alive to pursue the Silmarils near the end of the First Age, would come to regret the oath. But they were forced to pursue their oath yet, not being able to cast it aside until its completion, and this would hasten them to meet their fates. Instead of deciding to repent and go west, they stole back the Silmarils from Aeonwe. Mithros would find his end in a fiery chasm where he cast himself in with a Silmaril, and Maglor would be doomed to wander the seaside, singing songs of his woe after casting his Silmaril into the ocean. Another oath that would lead to terrible consequences is the oath of the men of the White Mountains. After the coming of Elendil and his followers into the lands of Middle-earth in the late Second Age, Gondor was established by the sons of Elendil, Asildor and Anarion. Asildor brought a large stone from Numenor and set it upon a hill in southwest Gondor, and this would be named the Stone of Erech. The men of the White Mountains came and swore an oath of loyalty to Gondor upon the stone, stating that they would aid Gondor if Sauron ever returned. However, they had worshipped Sauron during the Dark Years, and when he returned, they broke their oath. Asildor cursed them as oathbreakers, saying that they should not know peace of death until they fulfilled their oath. Thus, they could not know peace until Aragorn Elisar came to them in the late Third Age and gave them a chance to fulfill their oath, which they did by fighting against the Corsairs of Umbar at Pelargir. They were thus released by the heir of Isildur. Now to move on to a different point, while Gollum may not swear an oath per se, he does promise by the Precious to serve the Master of the Precious. We'll come back to that later. However, while oaths sworn hastily or with fell intent in mind often led to dire consequences like the ones aforementioned, not all oaths were terrible. There was the oath of Finrod to Barahir and his kin for saving the elf's life, leading him to save Baron's life during the tale of Baron and Luthien. There was also the Quenya Oath of Elendil after landing in Middle-earth, and this oath was repeated by Aragorn, stating that they and their descendants should dwell in Middle-earth unto the ending of the world. There was also the rather ambiguous oath of Elendil and Gil-galad, and while we don't have many details about it, we know this oath, which invoked the name of Eru by Elendil, founded the last alliance of elves and men that defeated Sauron at the end of the Second Age. There too is the Oath of Eorl and Kyrion, stating an undying alliance between the kingdoms of Rohan and Gondor in the late Third Age. Eorl spoke his oath in the language of the Eothade, saying the enemies of Gondor would be the enemies of Rohan, and in Gondor's need, Rohan would aid them unto the end of Rohan's strength. This vow descended to his heirs, and they would have to keep it in faith unbroken, or they would become accursed, and the shadow would fall upon them. Kyrion, the steward of Gondor, spoke an oath of friendship and alliance as well, and he invoked the Valar and the name of Eru in Quenya, making it a very serious oath indeed. 
Only the king of the men of the West, or one with the king's authority, could call Iru's name into oaths, and this had not been done since Elendil and Gilgalad's oath of the Last Alliance. Throughout the years, Gondor and Rohan sent aid to each other during some terrible wars, but what is the most defining moment of this oath is when Theoden took his folk and saved Gondor during the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. This oath was renewed by the kings Aragorn and Eomir when they became kings. In the Legendarium, oaths have quite a powerful effect, sometimes for ill, but sometimes for good, if they were made for the right reasons. Now turning our attention to dooms and curses, I will group these together for the most part, and add fates and decisions to this group as well. Dooms and curses, for good or ill, ultimately put a person along a path towards a certain fate, and so they are quite similar, except curses are always ill-fated dooms, but not all dooms are bad. All of these are, in my mind, much more numerous than oaths, and I will not recount them all here, especially since some are minor, but we will look at the big ones. The Gift of Men was a doom laid upon the second-born children of Iluvatar, and it allowed men to be mortal, and to die of natural causes. While this originally was not meant to be a bad thing, and in fact is not seen as a bad thing by wise men, many came to see this doom as a curse. It allowed for men to go beyond the confines of Middle-earth, where others, such as the Elves or even the Valar, could not go, and did not know. For the dooms of the Valar and Maiar and the doom of the Eldar were different than the doom of men. Such a fate could not be easily changed or reversed. But it could be delayed. If the man Tor did indeed join the Elder Race, the Elves, then perhaps his fate was changed and Baron and Luthien were allowed to be resurrected to live a mortal life together. However, the Gift of Men is perhaps one of the strongest fates in Arda, for even the Nazgul, who were kept alive by rings, eventually died when the One Ring was destroyed. And the Oathbreakers, not released from Arda by death because of Isildur's curse, were eventually given that when their oath was fulfilled. Again, this doom may be delayed, but it is inevitable. The Doom, or the Curse of Mandos, also known as the Doom of the Noldor, was proclaimed by Mandos ere the Noldor left Valinor in the Years of the Trees, and it stated that woe and a harsh fate would come upon the Noldor if they did not repent of their rebellion against the Valar and repent the first kinslaying. Furthermore, if they went and stayed in Middle-earth, and would not come to Mandos through travel or death, they would become shadows of regret before the race of men that came after. The Noldor, besides Fenarfin and his followers, did not take heed of this, and they continued forth into Beleriand. After this, the Noldor who left Valinor saw few lasting victories, and instead they saw much ruin and death until after the War of Wrath, when the few surviving Noldor were pardoned. Some of the Noldor, such as Galadriel, would continue to live in Middle-earth in the Second Age and beyond, but would eventually pass into the West. Another curse is that of Morgoth upon the House of Hurin. During the story of the Children of Hurin, we see how each family member came to a different tragic end because of this curse. Now there are also some smaller ones as well, such as the curse set upon the Nauglamir and the rest of the treasure from Doriath by the Dwarf Lord of Nograd. The Nauglamir would eventually return to Doriath, and Doriath would be destroyed, and then the same thing would happen to the Havens of Sirion. However, the curse of Mandos, the curse of Morgoth and Hurin's family, the Oath of Feanor and his sons, and the curse from the Dwarf as well as some other possible fates, all played a role in the deeds regarding the Nauglamir. Looking in the future now, Isildur cursed the men of the White Mountains for breaking their oath, meaning that his curse was the consequence of their breaking the oath. While there are probably others, the final curse or doom I want to discuss here is the one Frodo makes on Smeagol. In the Two Towers, after Smeagol swore by the Precious to serve Frodo, as I stated before, Frodo somewhat foretells Gollum's doom, saying, quote, in the last need, Smeagol, I should put on the Precious, and the Precious mastered you long ago. If I, wearing it, were to command you, you would obey, even if it were to leap from a precipice or to cast yourself into the fire. And such would be my command." End quote. Now before the deeds in Samoth Nower in Mount Doom, Frodo speaks to Gollum, quote, Be gone, and trouble me no more. If you touch me ever again, you shall be cast yourself into the fire of doom." End quote. Of course, this becomes true, for Gollum did take the ring from Frodo after biting Frodo's finger off, 
and not long after he found his fate in the fire of the mountain. I would say Smingle's promise was close enough to an oath to have some power, and he broke it, for he betrayed the Master of the Precious at that time he betrayed Frodo, even if he would have tried to use the loophole of serving himself as the new Master of the Precious. And furthermore, he invokes the doom Frodo set upon him, and found his end in the fire. Perhaps Frodo only foreshadowed Gollum's death and nothing more, but I think Iru Aluvatar played some part in this, just as it seems he played some part in every oath, doom, and curse. Now let's begin that conversation. Why do oaths, dooms, and curses have such power? Now I want to apply some philosophy here, and though I may be wrong in my theories and ideas about the powers of oaths, dooms, and curses, as there seems to be a lot to them, I just want to throw some possibilities out there. Let me know your thoughts about all of these in the comments below, for I'm quite curious. It seems clear that, no matter what, oaths, dooms, and curses have power, as it is undeniable that Isildur laid a curse upon the Oathbreakers. I believe this plays into the more spiritual, metaphysical, soft magic, where the rules of magic aren't entirely defined in Tolkien's works, but beings of certain spiritual levels have types of magic. However, I suppose with other oaths and dooms, one could try to argue a free will point of view, saying that every person who is affected by oaths, dooms, and curses either does things to aid or hinder the idea of them, based on their own free will, and that is that. This mode of thought may state that the only true power oaths, dooms, and curses hold is that people believe they have power at all. For instance, perhaps if Mithros and Maglor had gone west after the War of Wrath, instead of continuing to hunt for the Silmarils as they did, they may have found peace. However, I think that is a very difficult and perhaps impossible argument to make about Tolkien's works, as there are many pieces of evidence that state oaths, dooms, and curses actually have powers that lead to specific conclusions and results, regardless of some of the actions people take because of them. For instance, Horan could not overcome the curse that was laid upon him and his house. There is also a determinist or necessitarian argument to be made, saying oaths, dooms, and curses play out in the same way as everything else in Middle-earth, as determined in the beginning by the music of the Anur and Iru himself. Perhaps dooms and curses are just foretellings of the necessary future that must be, while oaths determine the future and curb events to happen as they do. While this is more possible than the aforementioned free will argument about Middle-earth, this would negate the powers of oaths, dooms, and curses, for then everything that happened in the history of Middle-earth would have happened anyway, regardless of such things, because each event was determined or necessary from the beginning. However, there's also a compatibility argument as well, and this is what I tend to believe concerning Tolkien's works. This is also where I think Iru Aluvatar comes into play. It is clear he does not interfere directly much in the Legendarium, but he does very rarely, like when he caused the downfall of Numenor. But it's possible he interferes a lot more through these oaths, dooms, and curses, while he lets many other things play out as they may through free will. In the Ainu Lindale, after the music of the Ainur, Iru shows the Ainur a vision of the world to be. Quote, the history was incomplete, and the circles of time not full wrought when the vision was taken away. And some have said that the vision ceased ere the fulfillment of the dominion of men, and the fading of the firstborn. Wherefore, though the music is over all, the Valar have not seen as with sight the later ages or the ending of the world." End quote. Now, Iru gave this vision, and he took it away. While it appears only Iru knows the full fate of Arda, he allows things to play out as they will, those things possibly being the incomplete or unknown parts of the vision, at least in some regard allowing room for free will. The powers and knowledge of Iru is a whole different debate, just like the free will versus determinism versus compatibilism in Middle-earth conversation. Perhaps I will speak more to those ideas in different videos, if you all would like me to do so. For our purposes here, I think it is rather safe to say that oaths, dooms, and curses are determined events by the people who make them, and they are carried out by Iru or other things he set into motion. Perhaps Mandos, the doomsman of the Valar, plays some role in this as well, as he pronounces the judgments of Iru as Iru gives them to him. Just as there is a soft magic that underlies the world of Arda, perhaps oaths, dooms, and curses tap into that magic. Thus, in this compatibility argument, some events that do not interfere with oaths, dooms, and curses would be controlled by free will, while the events that, in fact, interfere with such things would be more determined. 
This would give further credibility to the idea that Gollum did not simply slip and fall into Mount Doom, but he was pushed in by Eru to see the fulfillment of the doom Frodo laid upon him. And perhaps by invoking the doom of Gollum, that was the only way Eru could step in to save the world. Perhaps Eru does not overall directly intervene with events, but sees oaths, dooms, and curses upheld and fulfilled. While invoking the name of Eru to uphold an oath lends power and importance to that oath, I believe oaths, dooms, and curses are powerful enough in Middle-earth regardless, as Eru sought to enforce them. In a Tolkien fans subreddit thread that I have linked in the description, the user Amsteel27 posted a paper he wrote called Contractarianism. Please check it out for further information and for a source of this video. In his paper, Andrew Steele speaks about how promises or contracts are made in the Legendarium, and how there are consequences for these promises. If the promises are kept, the characters are rewarded. For instance, in keeping the oaths of Eorl and Kyrion, Gondor and Rohan saved one another multiple times, and they had victories and a strong alliance with one another. But there are also dire punishments for breaking oaths, such as the men of the White Mountains becoming Oathbreakers. Again, there's a link to the subreddit where he posted his paper. Please check that out in the description below. Finally, it seems oaths, dooms, and curses can mutually interact with one another, as a doom or curse is usually the punishment for a broken oath, like with the oath of the men of the mountains and the curse of a sealed door. But the two also may act independently, as an oath may be fulfilled without a doom or curse being involved, like with the oaths of Eorl and Kyrion, and a doom or curse can be levied without an oath being involved, like the curse of Melkor upon Horan's family. Ultimately, it is clear that there is a power of oaths, dooms, and curses that interact with many events and characters in Tolkien's works. From the oaths, dooms, and curses of Tolkien's works, we see how powerful loyalty and promises are, and that we must not be faithless. We also see that, no matter how ill-fated events in our lives seem, we must face them nonetheless with hope for the future. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you all enjoyed this rather different kind of discussion. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections about the oaths, dooms, and curses in Middle-earth? I have quite a love for philosophy, and it is interesting to see how these things play into that in the context of Middle-earth, even if it is quite subjective, so I am curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you all for allowing me to indulge in that. Please check out our music channel, Facebook, Twitter, Merch, and Patreon for our Discord server and podcasts. Royan and I just made a podcast where we do a tier list of the named weapons in Middle-earth and the parallelisms between Theoden and Denethor. And if you're interested, please head on over to our Patreon and check that out. Links for all of those are in the description below. A huge shout out to our Valor tier patrons over on Patreon, Adrian De La Tour, Chris Ortner, Peter Shepard, Cal Wetzel, Lane Grimes, Mr. Vat Nadal, Samuel McBee, Jonathan Putnam, and Kiari Kawaii. Finally, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today, and I'll see you all again next Sunday at 4pm Eastern Standard Time for our next livestream. Royan from our Patreon should be joining us for this one, and I look forward to talking to you all then. Everyone, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my great friends.